Hello and welcome to our latest Glasgow Loves EU lockdown live stream. And this evening we're having a bit of a diversion from normal politics and we're going to be talking to two Euro babies. So last week I was on Twitter, probably January the 1st, and I came across a conversation by sheer chance between Chris and Manas, who are here with us this evening, and they were discussing the fact that they were both Euro babies and I thought, what on earth is that? So it turns out they were both born January the 1st, 1973, when the UK joined the European Economic Community. So um, just after the stroke of midnight, they were born. <laughs> so we've got this evening, we're uh, really pleased to welcome Dr. Manaz Hashmi and Chris Dotti. Um, so I've just found a wee bit of history locally as well from our Glasgow. I thought, is there a Glasgow Euro baby? So um, this is what I managed to find. The first of Scotland's new Europeans it was a little baby boy. He was born a minute past midnight in, in Paisley. Um, I've not managed to track him down, but um, and there's the front page of the Herald from that day. So we've got Prime Minister Edward Heath, who was, was the, the Prime Minister at the time that we joined the European Economic Community. And I've got a quote here from the, the BBC website. He said, it's going to be a gradual development and obviously things are not going to happen overnight. But from the point of view of our everyday lives, we will find there is a great cross fertilization of knowledge and information, not only in business, but in every other sphere. And this will enable us to be more efficient and more competitive in gaining more markets, not only in Europe, but in the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, I think certainly we did progress in that time and, and lived up to a lot of that. But um, so uh, where else? And there was a wee explainer just in the Glasgow Herald. I think uh, Paul, who's with us this evening doing the social media, is going to just share that on hopefully the link. To, if anyone wants to have a look at that first uh, Glasgow Herald of the of us joining the European Economic Community. So there was a bit of an explainer there um, of all the new terms. Um, some of it quite complicated. So. <laughs> Um, but that, certainly about freedom of movement, I've pulled out that one. I notice it says we didn't have freedom of movement initially in Northern Ireland. I meant to look that up, but I don't know why that was excluded to start with. So if anyone knows, maybe you can text us in. Um, so, um, and so we'll maybe just start with Manas this evening. Um, and I think you were one of Birmingham's first Euro babies. What time were you born and what were the family memories of, of being a Euro baby? I was born at, uh, thank you for having me for a start. And um, I was born at um, four minutes past midnight. Um, and uh, apparently I'm told it appeared in the newspapers locally, um, the Birmingham Post and Evening Mail and this sort of thing, um, with a lot of kind of celebratory fanfare about um, Birmingham's first Euro baby. So in terms of our kind of, family sort of um, kind of history um, that meant that every New Year's Eve on the stroke of midnight my dad would give me a big hug and say happy birthday Euro baby <laughs> and then proceed to tell this story to absolutely anybody who would listen who was around um, and I think he was particularly um, sort of chuffed about the fact that Birmingham's first Euro baby had been Pakistani so of Pakistani origin so um, that just kind of really pleased him and um, yeah and it's just something that I hadn't really thought much about to be honest um, uh, until the referendum and kind of obviously very very <laughs> pro-Remain very very upset about the rep referendum result but um, it was I tweeted what I did on um, like just after midnight because it made me think about um, what my dad always used to say at midnight. And I kind of just thought, you know, that's it now. We're no longer part of Europe. And it just felt very, um, I just felt very emotional, very sort of upset about it really um, at, at the time. So that, that's why I sent out that tweet and I was kind of quite overwhelmed by the reaction to it. But I got to meet another Euro baby and I thought Euro baby was just a Birmingham thing but then I realised from the reaction to that tweet that it was obviously happening around the country and it's so lovely to see, sort of hear and kind of very poignant to hear that Ted Heath quote really isn't it about kind of the aspirations and hopes for this integration with Europe and where we've ended up today so 
Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And you you said your parents came from Pakistan, did? Yeah, they did. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, one of the other weird things that happened with that tweet is that people started talking about Midnight's Children, which is a which is a Salman Rushdie novel, um, some of you might know, and um, about um, babies that were born at midnight at the point of the um, partition of India and Pakistan and independence from the British. So it got me thinking about partition and, um, and my, um, my dad kind of um, fled across from India to Pakistan at the point of partition um, and was always very sort of um, influenced by what he saw about nationalism and um, kind of um, sectarian violence um, and religious extremism. And when he came to the UK, he, um, he um, devoted most of his professional life to um, race relations and he got an OBE for the work he did and was very kind of big part of um, what he did. And he was very, very pro-European because he saw it as a move away from nationalism and sectarianism and all of these sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting, yeah. And and you work in the, the health service, I think you've... Um... I do. So I work as a consultant psychiatrist in Birmingham mm -hmm. um, and um, in a, um, you know, in a city sort of area. And um, I've been working in mental health for about 22 years now. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so um, I, I work in the NHS. Mm -hmm. And have you seen, I mean, there's been a few things we've heard about um, that might impact on health, like the European Medicines Agency. Mm. I've heard recently there's a sort of network for rare diseases. And do you know how many of these things are, are you're going to be able to participate in or is it going to be difficult in the future? Um, well, there's like a whole load of impacts. And the first one is that I suppose sh soon after the referendum, we started going to leaving dues at work of European colleagues who had been at great cost and great effort by the NHS, kind of handpicked and headhunted from across Europe to come and work in our centres of excellence. And suddenly all these people were saying they didn't feel either welcome or they didn't feel that their children's future was secure in this country. And we started going to the leaving dues, <laughs> which sounds really trite, but it was quite shocking to me really that people that we've kind of worked alongside and colleagues we've worked with um, suddenly didn't feel that their future was in Britain anymore. Um, so, um, you know, and the NHS only runs because of immigrants, a lot from Europe, from all over the world, but, you know, very, very, very much so from Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. Um, so in that sense, it feels disastrous. On a more selfish note, I was having one of these kind of chats that I do sporadically with my husband about, you know, where could we go? Where should we live? And, you know, he turned to me and said, you, you do realise that our qualifications are no longer recognised anywhere in Europe as of January the 1st, which again, is something that I hadn't really thought about. But um, I think more widely for the for the NHS, um, I just think it's, it's going to be an absolute staffing catastrophe as the reality of Brexit unfolds and more and more people feel kind of unwelcome and you know just kind of there seems to be a lot of pettiness around acknowledging the contribution of these people who've come and dedicated their lives and careers and paid their taxes into this country in support of the NHS and a, a lot of pettiness about recognizing their qualifications and making them pay additional fees for the privilege of staying here on top of their taxes so I see it as being a disaster and the kind of um you know, that there's always kind of um, people talk about a British brain drain, but we're going to have a, and already have had a massive European brain drain of kind of people that we should be so grateful have given up their lives to come and work in, in our NHS. Um, in terms of medicines and stuff, I think for the last year and a half, we've had occasional sort of frantic emails from pharmacies saying we don't know what's going to happen with X, Y and Z medication after Brexit. And, and you know, and these are the alternatives you can use. But when you've got a patient in front of you who's been taking the same medication for years and years, trying to explain that to them is, um, you feel, you know, why should I be in the position of having to explain this to this person who is whose life is dependent upon having kind of this treatment? Um, you know, so, so that's the kind of main impact. Yeah. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, so that's, and, and you've also been involved in teaching medicine as well, and sort of the university side. Is, 
is there likely to be an impact there, do you think? Um, well, I mean, I've just start, started sort of working at Aston Medical School, which is a brand new medical school. And at the moment, more than half of their um, students are international students from Europe and across the world. So, um, so um, it's difficult to say, but I'd anticipate that um, kind of, you know, not just from the European students, actually, but internationally, um, as Britain is, appears to be and is perceived to be more inward looking and um, less of a kind of an international place to be. Um, I would imagine there are other more attractive options for students to go to, um, which, you know, is only to the detriment of our universities. And, and that applies to lecturers. You know, one of my friends who was uh, an academic at Birmingham University has moved to Europe, of German origin, but has moved to Europe. So, um, you know, I think, I think our universities are going to be quite heavily impacted by, by this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, definitely a, a lot of impacts. So we'll come back in a minute to hear you do a wee bit more about your family and things. Um, we'll, we're going to have a wee chat to Chris as well, um, and then we'll come back and speak to Manas. And if, if anyone has any um, comments that, or questions they'd like to send in, um, please send them in on our social media and Paul will pick those up. Um, so I've got a picture here, I'm just going to pull up for, of Chris from the, is it from the Liverpool Echo? The, yep. <laughs> so there's Chris and he's, he's actually probably one of the first Euro twins. Um, with probably, I would imagine. With your sister there. Um, and yeah, that's, that's me complaining on the left. <laughs> and what was your sister called again? Linda. Linda, hello Linda. Um, and I see your poor mum, I've actually got twins. And I see right. your poor mum only discovered she was having twins eight weeks beforehand. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. And she's only discovering now that I'm sending her photo of having just given birth to twins around the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. So but well as, as you yeah. say, Jenny, it was, it was interesting because I hadn't really thought about the idea of how this had impacted on on other people and, and uh, Manas is, is obviously a, a better wordsmith than I am. I'm, I'm sure I've I've tweeted those photos and my frustrations a, a few times over the years, but um, uh, she's too modest to mention, but that, that tweet that Manas sent out, we got something like 6,300 likes, was it? Um, and then, uh, which I, I can imagine you had a, a fair bit of time on your, on your birthday trying to get through <laughs> your Twitter mentions. Um, <laughs> But I, I just responded to, to that because I, I had the uh, the photos available as well, saying that she would put into words exactly how I felt. Uh, and then it was nice to get in touch with you and start talking about it. Oh, that's good. Brilliant. And and you've been a sort of exemplary Euro baby because I noticed you seem to have worked all over Europe. And, you know, yeah. what, what got you started on, on that? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, obviously, kind of growing up, the you know, as... As Manas was saying before, the 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 idea of being Euro twin kind of came up every year. It didn't seem that important in the sense that um, being in the European Union felt inevitable. Then it didn't feel like big news. Um, obviously, telling new friends that I was on the front page of the local paper when I was born was quite fun, um, and my mum's always kept the newspapers. But the the European part of it um, wasn't a big deal apart from once a year we we talked about it kind of thing. Um, and my family memories, my, I don't think my mum's ever forgiven me for ruining her New Year's Eve party, um, <laughs> which uh, she constantly reminds me about. Um, and and the, the other family, family memory is the, the kind of journalistic mendacity of, uh, yeah, my twin sister's called Linda, but not spelt how it is in the newspaper. And uh, my mum's Jean, not Joan. And uh, my, my elder sister was very upset that a journalist um, asked her about reindeers and she said they have two legs at the front and two at the back and the, it was better in the newspaper to say reindeers have two legs. There was a, a lot of bitterness about the, uh, the newspapers uh, back in the day. Um, but yeah, I, um, I don't know whether this is uh, related or not, but I, I did um, find when I was a, a teenager that I was kind of interested in languages and went on a French exchange and um, uh, decided that um, it was something I could be interested in because back in the day if you remember people who are our generation um, there was a lot of talk about Europe not 
just because of it, we were, we'd been in the common market since 1973. But um, the time I was kind of taking options and deciding about A levels in university, the Euro, Euro tunnel had just been finished. Um, there was the Maastricht Treaty and, and creation of the, the single market. And there was a lot of talk about languages of the free future and, and it'll help you get a job. And if you, you, you learn foreign languages, that will really help you become employable. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I went to university, studied French and business. I spent a year in France as part of that. Um, and then got a job in Birmingham in Hayes, the recruitment company, after I graduated. And uh, a couple of years later, um, there was an advert in the internal newsletter saying, who wants to open an office in Portugal? And um, I thought, well, why not? Because I had the right to and I knew a bit of Portuguese. And, um, and I only thought it would be an adventure for a couple of years. That was in, um, that was in 1998. Um, I was still only kind of um, 25. Um, so I thought, you know, do something interesting for a couple of years and then come back and, and do the, the traditional life that I'd expected. And I never got around to going back. I lived in uh, Lisbon for three and a half years. And then my boss said, um, do you want to open the office in Barcelona? And I thought about it for two seconds and said, yes, yes, I do. Um, and I moved to Barcelona um, then in 2002 and uh, haven't moved back. Um, I have two children who are British and Catalan and Spanish and European at the moment. Um, uh, and I think it's one of, one of the sad parts of, uh, of the Brexit process is that my children will, will almost have to choose a, a sense of belonging more than they did in the past. We've always in our family found that a sense of belonging can, can be um, inclusive, not exclusive, that the fact that I feel like I come from Liverpool doesn't make me feel less English or British or European. And, and that's the way my kids have, have grown up, um, that in, they are the only Everton supporters in their Catalan school. Um, but they're also the only Barca supporters uh, amongst their English friends. And, and they've never felt that they had to choose before now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's hard when you're trying to think like, certainly for me, like Glas Glaswegian, Scottish, European. I, I, would, I wouldn't really be able to put them in an order. You know, they're all, they're all sort of equal. But now, yeah. And, and like you're, this thing with them. Um, there was a, there was an item on the BBC News at lunchtime actually with people living in Spain and there was a family yeah the uh, one of the parents was Spanish one British but you're actually having to make these decisions then you know where are we going to live and things yeah. and you, you were the is it the president of the um, British Chamber yeah yeah so, so yeah I think just on, on that point Jenny I think that's a really interesting one that in all these debates about Brexit or about the, the political situation, um, there's a real assumption that, that people and families are kind of uh, not even two dimensional, they're one dimensional, that, that you can label people. And, and I think there's a real lack of, of discussion in the media or, or in politics about the fact that lots of families are blended in so many ways nowadays. Lots of people feel different senses of belonging come from different um uh, different parts of the world in in different ways so yeah I think that that you know that complexity to who we are as people and families is something that really should be talked about more um so yeah I do I've I still work for, for Hayes I run Hayes in in Spain but um I do think that when you live outside of your native country you you often feel even more patriotic because it's it's something you represent it's something that's special about you and different so I started getting involved in uh the British Chamber of Commerce in Spain a few years back um and then I've spent the uh, well, I was elected president in May 2016 and the previous president had told me, oh, you're just drinking sherry at lunchtime, so it's not too much work involved. And obviously that was a month before the referendum. And I can remember a couple of weeks before the referendum, I was doing a round table with the ambassador and a, a few uh, Spanish politicians prior to the, uh, to the vote and uh, discussing the pros and cons of, uh, uh, of the vote and the implications and as we left the round table at the end uh, the ambassador who i'd obviously coincided with him quite a, a few times on on similar events he, he got up and said to me thank god we'll never have to talk about brexit again and that, that was in <laughs> that was in early june 2016 so yeah that made uh, made things very different um 
I, uh, I was then all obviously involved in talking to government about the implications for British businesses in, in Spain and Europe um, of different kinds of, of trade deals and the, the repercussions that that would have. Um, and since then, I've become involved in the British Chambers of Commerce um, and the, the, the global network there. Um, I can't say I was too successful. Uh, people always say, well done on being president of the British Chamber of Commerce for the last four years. Well, thanks, but I didn't do much to get a better or I didn't successfully manage to, to have uh, enough influence to bear on, on getting uh, the right kind of deal that the British businesses in, in Europe want. Um, but I tried my best. It was a, a frustrating process. Um, mm -hmm. I, at one point, the uh, someone from the embassy said to me, well, the people who came out from Whitehall last night um, felt that you weren't constructive enough. And I was saying, well, look, you know, they say, tell us what business wants. And we say, well, we want membership of the European Union. They say, well, that's impossible. Tell us what you want. Well, we want to stay part of the customs union. Well, that's impossible. Tell us what you want. Well, we want free movement of, of citizens and, and, and a trade deal. Well, that's impossible. What do you want? Well, stop asking what I want, tell me what I'm going to have and I'll make the best of it, but, but don't try and buy me in as if, as if I support this. Um, so it was frustrating at times. We, we did our best and, and we still will. And I think that's, that's an important thing to remember. And none of us who, who are in favour of, of close relationships, uh, a close relation between uh, the UK and, uh, and Europe wanted to go the long road back. We hoped it would be a shorter road, but that doesn't mean we should stop working towards what we think is the right future in any case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're being quite modest because I think you, you got, was it this year, the NBE for all your... I did. I don't know whether on... that's a sign that I didn't kick <laughs> the government hard enough, to be honest. Um, I, I, I was, um, strangely enough, for a, for a scouser, um, which, by the way, I do have the Scouse accent in Spanish as well and in <laughs> French. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit strange. I, I was awarded an MBE for services to British business in Spain last year. Um, but unfortunately, I was due to go to the palace in June to receive the medal. And obviously, they, well, I don't want to be blamed for infecting the Queen with coronavirus or anything. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable with waiting. I'm not sure my mother will forgive me that either because she's bought two dresses ready to go to the palace and she Aww. hasn't got her trip to the palace yet. So hopefully at some point yeah. this year, we hopefully. will be there and, and picking up the medal. Yeah. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Good. And you'll have to send us a picture as well if you do that. <laughs> yeah. One, one, so... one quick thing. I know I've talked a lot. That oh. We didn't mention the time of my birth that you asked Manas and you didn't ask me. Oh, sorry. Me. Yeah. My twin <laughs> sister was born at 10 minutes past midnight and I was born 13 minutes past. So we were the first twins, but we weren't the, the first uh, babies born in the new, new year. What yeah. constantly fascinates me is if my mum had pushed just a bit harder, we would have been <laughs> born three minutes apart in different years. And that yeah. would have been quite cool. That would. No, that's something I've never forgiven her. Uh huh. <laughs> I know you could have had your own birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. One, one of my uh, sons was uh, just a twin joke for twins. Um, he was moaning that um, that he he would like to be a single a single child because he was fed up with all the noise around him in the in the car and his his twin said, "Well, you were for fifteen minutes." <laughs> 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 Sorry, diversion. <laughs> so. Um, and just back to Manas, you were you were you were saying that you, there's been an impact on your family. Your your sister has had to make these some yeah, difficult choices. So, so my sister's uh, married to a French man, and they've sort of divided their time. He he has a business in Bordeaux, and um, and they divided their time between Birmingham and Bordeaux, really. And um, I think the whole kind of uncertainty around, well, even stuff like kind of getting the dog to and fro Bordeaux, between Bordeaux and Birmingham and just stuff that seems really silly, but kind of cumulatively um, has quite a big impact. I, I think um, sort of in the end, they decided just before Christmas that they were moving back. So they, they, they've kind of closed up their house here and she's a GP and the kids were in school here and they've, they've moved to Bordeaux now, which is um, nice for us because we can visit them, but also really sad as well, because it should be that, <laughs> it feels like it should be that we can all, live freely and still be kind of um, able to um, have access to this wonderful thing that we had and it's not is it so yeah I know I mean I still hold out some hope that we maybe can claw back some of these things hopefully but yeah maybe as it becomes clearer like what, what we're missing people will 
be more of a call for that yeah but sounds nice Bordeaux sounds lovely <laughs> I think there's a lot of face saving that will have to be done though which is probably going to be the biggest sticking point isn't it as opposed to the actual um how politically possible it is there's there's kind of a whole load of face saving that we're going to have to get past yeah yeah I mean the thing is that there, there, there could have been a whole variety of types of of leave which like as Chris was sort of saying with the different things that business were hoping for that there, these mm. the, there could have been options but anyway um I wonder if there's any questions come in let's see if there's anything coming in Paul um I've got one from Craig um from Manas just asking so as, as a mental health professional um is there a, is there a specific unique term for the anxiety caused by Brexit or, or <laughs> could there be there should be there definitely there should, should be. be I think so <laughs> I mean, just feel, I mean, it's it's like um, like we've what everyone said today, this evening, um, we, we all sound as though we felt like it's a mass, just an integral part of our identity and any kind of identity ruptures are really distressing, aren't they? So, um, and I think probably many of us didn't realise how much a part of our identity it was until it got threatened. So, um, but yeah, there should be an ICD-10 proper term for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and just one other comment, thinking about, you know, the fact that you're both Euro babies and you're in the press, we haven't heard much about Brexit babies. And wh why is that? Is is that a bit of an indication of the lack of things to celebrate? And are we going to have to wait for rejoiner babies? Something to possibly look forward to in the future? Could be, could be. <laughs> oh, and um, Chris, could you just tell us a wee bit more just to sort of finish off like just what types of businesses were going out to Spain was it was it people taking branches of businesses from Britain or moving whole yeah wholesale it, over there yeah it's a bit of everything um I think you know the Chamber of Commerce for instance represents 300 companies and that's a mix of Spanish companies who've got huge investments in the UK um such as Iberdrola um uh, and the obviously the the big chains, the uh, British Airways is part of the uh, IAG group, which is Spanish owned. So there's large, large companies on, on both sides. And then there's, there's the small traders. Um, you know, we, we can't forget that 45% um, of British exports still go to the EU. Um, so we were dealing with a lot of companies who um, were either exporting, importing or investing in the, uh, in the UK and in Spain. Um, I think... We, <laughs> Coming back to the other point about the, the, the effect of, of Brexit in terms of mental health, I think there's a lot of, I, I certainly feel a bit of survivor's guilt about it as well, that I benefited from something that people aren't going to be able to in the future. And I think in terms of finding ways around it, I think um, certain groups of people will find a way around it. I think that, um, you know, middle and upper class people with, with resources will find a way to still be able to move around Europe and for their children to get opportunities. And, and what saddens me is that, uh, as ever, it's the, the people who are less fortunate who will suffer. And, and yes, you know, if I was um, British um, today living in the UK and wanted to move out at the age of 48 with good resources and experience to Spain, then I'm sure my companies and the, the government would find a way. But the 25-year-old that I was when I moved abroad, then, you know, that's more difficult. And, and you know, it's not just lucky middle-class privileged people like me who, who are British and live in Europe. It's people who work on, on campsites and as in hotels as well. It's people who are getting their first exposure to new languages, new cultures, new friends, new ways of, of living because they, they had the right to. And, and that's the part that really saddens me, um, that it won't affect me or my children that much, but the person who I was 23 years ago wouldn't have the same opportunities. And I think the, you know, that idea that the people who are affected don't really understand possibly quite a lot of them, how much they're going to be affected is real part, really part of the frustration for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a really good interview, actually, this evening. Thank you both. Would you like to say anything more, Manas, any other? No, just uh, it's lovely to meet another Euro baby. And thank you so much for inviting me to come on tonight. Yeah, no, I, I, it's been brilliant. I mean, I, I think when I first emailed you or tweeted you both, I, I had no idea it would work out so well. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you both. Um, any more comments, Paul? Is that, was it, any more questions or anything from the people watching? Uh, just a couple of people saying just really enjoyed it. It's been a really heartwarming, a uh, bit of a diversion for us, a bit different and a really, a really lovely conversation, basically. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank will, you for watching. Will you invite oh. us back, Jenny, to uh, to meet the rejoiner babies? When will you, do. When, you do, when you do that, <laughs> you can give them some tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you.